Welcome to The Miracle You, guiding you on the journey towards finding passion and purpose and how to discover, create, and live a life by your design. Whether your success has been plentiful or your missed opportunities have been overwhelming, we can help you become a more empowered, masterful person and show you how to share your gift with the world. It's time to inspire change from within with the host of The Miracle You, Vince Kramer. Hello, Imagination. I'm Vince Kramer, your host, and welcome to The Miracle You, where you learn about the magic of living your life by finding the example in real life. One of the things that we need to be willing to do as we start moving towards the life that we're meant to live is to go beyond what we know and step out into the unknown. Be willing to take a chance and look at life in a way that we never expected to look at it before. Today's guest really emulates what I'm talking about, the willingness to open the door to something new, the willingness to look at who you are as an individual and then bring that to the world in a way that no one else may be doing it, to take a chance, to learn on the move, to try to understand something in a way that it's never been understood before, and then to share yourself in your entirety with the world in a way that will make a difference, and a difference in a way that you want to experience it and the way that you want to share it. I'm with Dr. Bob Uslander today, and I can't wait to share Bob with you and the story that he has and what he brings to the world. Dr. Bob has been practicing medicine for more than 25 years. His concierge palliative care practice, Integrated MD Care, includes a team of holistic practitioners serving the elderly, those experiencing complex illness, and those needing end-of-life care or aid in dying assistance. Dr. Bob is dedicated to helping people live with joy and without fear and struggle at any stage of life. He is dedicated to helping patients live and die with more peace and dignity on their own terms. Dr. Bob is the, also the host of a podcast, A Life and Death Conversation. Hello, Dr. Bob. Hey, Vince. How are you doing today? I am wonderful. Yourself? I'm great. Thank you. It is so great to have you here today, and the introduction was, ah, there's so many gaps in it. Can you fill in a little bit of it for us? Well, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm all about filling in gaps. That's kind of what my life has, has turned into. Um, I guess the, I'll try to make it succinct. Um, my background was in emergency medicine. Um, I'm originally from the Midwest, grew up outside of Chicago, go Cubs. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, sort of escaped the Midwest and started, went to medical school at UCLA and uh, back to Chicago for training in emergency medicine, which was an incredible um, adventure. And I practiced emergency medicine in Chicago, hospitals like Cook County and inner city hospitals. I, I had married a gal from Guam, and so we moved to Guam, and I got to, I was the first emergency physician on the island of Guam, and, which was pretty cool, fascinating experience. Um, ended up moving back to Northern California and practicing emergency medicine in a little town up near Yosemite. And uh, and then about 10 years into my career, I had a, an experience that changed the trajectory of my life and my career when a very good friend of mine died uh, at the age of 32 of melanoma. And before that, I had, as an ER doc, I had been exposed to a lot of death, a lot of most a lot of traumatic death, a lot of unanticipated uh, death, and death was always sort of the enemy to me. And when I, my friend was getting sicker, I started providing care for him, and and then he got pretty pretty ill and had a hard time walking and needed more support. And we brought in a local hospice team, and that's what kind of changed my my life was working together with a team of hospice nurses, social workers. Uh, spiritual counselors to provide this amazing, beautiful uh, team of support and love around my friend Aaron, 
And as he took his last breaths, we were all with him. And I just saw it could be different. I saw that dying, even though in his case especially it was it was tragic, um, he left behind three kids that were five, three, and one, and a beautiful wife. And it was tragic, but it was beautiful and peaceful. And the, it was such a different way of providing care for somebody. So that's kind of the, planted the seed of of um, what it could be like. And, and at the same time, I also had to wonder, why do we have to wait until somebody's dying to be able to provide that kind of support and care and tell them how much we love them, help them have you know the, the, the last adventures or the do their final things that are really important to them. It just seemed like we were missing it missing the boat. Um, fast forward several years, I continued doing emergency medicine, but but gravitated more towards taking care of seniors and people who, who needed that kind of loving, uh, kind of integrated care. And I started a house call practice and then a, a home care company. And, uh, and then I moved on to Southern California to San Diego and through a series of, of just um, events that occurred, I ended up getting into palliative care and hospice. Um, and I worked in a traditional model of palliative care and hospice, and I saw how, you, how, how we could provide value and support and do it very differently. But in the medical system, the constraints and the limitations and the gaps are still so severe that people's needs were not being met. And I saw a lot of people, even though they had access to better, better and, and more services, a lot of people were still dying badly. Well, and there could- was... Could I get you to share with everybody what palliative care is before you go on with this yeah, your story? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so palliative care is a uh, it's a philosophy as well as a, a medical specialty and, a, and an actual um, type of care. It's the idea is it's it's a it's taking a, a holistic, integrated approach to providing care for people with complex illnesses. It could be at any stage of the illness. And it involves, ideally, a team of doctors, nurses, social workers, spiritual counselors, similar to what happens in hospice. Most people are probably familiar with hospice, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And so hospice hospice is actually a form of palliative care. Hospice is palliative care for people who have a, a prognosis of six months or less. But that's kind of limiting. There's a lot of people who need more support who, are not, who don't have a six-month prognosis. So the idea is palliative care is, 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 is something that can be provided to people in a hospital with a team that's dedicated to symptom management, dealing with their emotional issues, their existential um, issues, and helping to improve the quality of their life. It addresses the, the person more than the disease. Traditional medical care is addressing, it's really focused on a disease process. Palliative care, hospice care, they really fo- try to focus on the person and meeting their, you know, their complex needs, supporting the families as well. Uh, so, so that's kind of the overview of, of palliative care Thank in the you. community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the community, palliative care is now becoming a little bit more prevalent. It's still very early in the game. It's hard. There isn't really a good reimbursement model for it, so it's hard to it's hard to make it work through the traditional medical system. So, that kind of leads me to that to the next phase of my career which was um, recognizing how valuable these palliative care type services were and, and hospice care, but, but there were still so many gaps because it's limited by insurance and regulations and, and you know, financial constraints. I saw patients who were you know, very well off, millionaires, billionaires, who, who, need, who weren't getting any better care than anybody else because there was no mechanism in place to provide a higher level of care. So I started my own practice, integrated MD care, to be able to give a, you know, fill the gaps to provide medical care in people's homes, nursing care, social workers, uh, and, and integrative therapists, like massage therapists and music and, um, and acupuncture and Reiki. I have a, a nurse that specializes in cannabis medicine to help people learn how to utilize you know, cannabis in its various forms to alleviate their symptoms. We're just focused on improving people's quality of life, supporting them, taking the fear out of what they're dealing with, 
help them have the, the, the most meaningful and joyful life and the most peaceful, dignified, and beautiful death. So we take them all the way to the end and, um, and guide them and support their families. And it's Vince, it's amazing. We've talked about some of the stories and some of the impact and on our patients and their families as well as on us. And um, I could talk about this for days <laughs> or months, but I'm going to shut up now so <laughs> you can get a word in, all right? Well, I'll tell you how, how <laughs> loving and, and how heart-centered it is. As you know, in Imagine Miracles, we, we teach the three parts of unique purpose, and the, and the third part is the divine intent or, or your mission. In, in, in a sentence or two, what, what is your mission in this moment? Well, my big mission is to is to uh, change the paradigm of how people die, is to change the conversation from one of, of fear and anxiety around death to one of celebration. To and, and the way that we do that is we engage with people and we re, and we help remove the fear. We help to uh, provide, you know, that when you think about uh, Maslow's pyramid, you know, the, the what we do is we try to uh, make sure that they have the base, the security, that they have, a, you know, they have physical security, and that they're not af afraid of because they're not dealing with pain and difficult uh, shortness of breath and all the symptoms that can terrify people, and also that they don't feel isolated and alone. And we can and kind of build on that, and we, we provide additional comforts all the way up to trying to help them self-actualize and have the most understanding um, and beauty through this final phase of life. Um, essentially, the mission of, the founda of, of our practice is similar to the mission of the foundation that we created, which is to reduce the suffering and improve the quality of life for people dealing with the challenges of aging, illness, and end of life. Oh, beautiful. When, when I talk to uh, the groups that I speak to, uh, one of the things that I mention to them is when you remove the fear in your life, you open the door to the love. And uh, what a powerful way to live the last few days, the last few months, even the last few years, in some cases for you, I, I know, of your life. So, wow, it's so powerful. You know, I'd, I'd like to to really help the audience see that along the way we have wake-up calls in life. And, and I know a lot of your patients have had wake-up calls, but a big one for you was when uh, Darren had his experience and, and what you went through there. Was there other little wake-up calls before that uh, happened in your life that you uh, didn't quite pay attention to or you ignored on, on your way in this journey? Uh, so yeah, so Darren, that experience with Darren was 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 huge. Subsequently, down the line, I think we'll probably talk about some of the the other ones that really clearly changed the trajectory powerfully. Before before that, uh, before Darren, I had I think I had a little like little twinges of wake up calls every time I I was part of a the death of a patient in my under my care. And as an ER doc, you you frequently, depending on where you're working, it's 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 pretty common to have people brought into the emergency room um, after a, a, a cardiac arrest or after a traumatic injury, and they're being resuscitated. The paramedics are are work are trying to revive them, and when they come in, you can get a sense pretty quickly based on how long they've been you know they've been out in the field or what they're what they what they look like, what their age is get a sense of what the, the chances of them having any kind of, of recovery, um, being able to be revived and then have any meaningful quality of life. And in the early part of my career, it's, it was just common, no matter what state the patient was in, the paramedics bring somebody in and they don't have a heartbeat and they're not breathing, you keep working on them. You keep running the code is what it's called. And the whole everyone comes comes together. The doctors, the nurses, everybody is like frantically trying to give medications, do CPR, put an airway in, watching the monitor, hoping that 
you know, the heartbeat comes back. Mm -hmm. What I started recognizing after, you know, the first couple dozen times that we did this is I, I didn't want the heartbeat to come back because I knew in most cases, in the vast majority of cases, I knew what, what that would result in. It would result in the person continuing to be flogged and, and, and everyone kind of experiencing more trauma. And if they did have a sustained heartbeat, they were going to end up in the intensive care unit for a day or two, and then the whole process would continue. And if they made it through that, then they were going to be, you know, in, either in a, in a coma or, or in a in severely, severely impaired state for a long time. Wow. So every time that was happening, I was, I was thinking, this is wrong. This is, you know, yeah, I understand that death is like our enemy, but this is, this is not right to do this. So I started over, I think, and it was probably after Darren that I, I stopped, I, I started giving it more consideration and people would, when pay, people would come in, I would pretty quickly determine, you know, they're dead and they need to stay dead and they're going to, we need to honor that. And, and at first I was a little anxious about it because I was bu kind of bucking the trend, bucking the system and going against the grain. And after the first couple of times I did that, the nurses started like expressing their gratitude. It's like, we, we don't want to keep doing this either. We, we really respect your, you know, your approach, your willingness to honor that and not force us to, to do something that we know is not appropriate. And. So, so those little that I guess those were little wake up calls. Each, each there was something about that process that was so sacred to me, and um, I, I didn't, I wasn't getting hardened to it. I was opening myself up. It's a great story. Quickly, um, I had a when I was in the ER, uh, kind of shortly after I was, kind of moving into this new awareness, I had a, there was a woman who was wheeling her mother out of the hospital. This, the, the, the woman, was the daughter was probably in her 70s. The mother was in her late 90s. She'd been in the hospital for a couple weeks, had really declined, had to go to a nursing home, but there was no nursing home within a couple hours of this hospital. So she was having to take her someplace so remote, and it was going to be a huge ordeal. And the patient had let her daughter know she doesn't want to live like this. She doesn't want to continue. So, she, But they were doing this because that's all they knew and this is what the doctors told them to do so she was wheeling her out of the hospital to get her in the car and she slumped over and stopped breathing and the daughter you know panicked and kind of rushed her into the emergency room wheeled her right in the midst of us and and we kind of picked the woman up and put her on a gurney and the daughter was outside the room and we were sort of just assessing the situation and it was clear that she had stopped breathing and she we had to make a choice um the daughter, they didn't have, they actually didn't have any any written paperwork to say that we should or shouldn't try to resuscitate her, but we elected to let her go. And and the, the daughter was frantic. She was just in tears, just overwhelmed. And we walked out. I walked out after a couple minutes, and I, you know, kind of braced her, and I said, "Sweet, hon, I'm, you know, I got, I have to tell you that your mom stopped breathing, her heart stopped, and um, and she's gone." And the woman just stopped, looked at me, wrapped her arms around me and said, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> she was she, – that's what she wanted. She wanted her mom to have a peaceful end. Right. She didn't want to have to keep doing, doing the same routine, and, but that's, the system didn't give her that support. Right, right. So that was, I, that was such a, a really pretty beautiful um, – it's, it's a funny story, but it – speaks to what we need to be aware of and helping people not get to the point where they're they feel like they're not getting the support that they need and the love that they need and the guidance that they need to have a peaceful end oh exactly and what a great story to lead me into my next question uh, we define miracle as through an act of love sharing your gifts and talents with the world so others can share theirs and and i know because i know you bob that one of your true gifts is connection. And as an ER doc, you, you really didn't have that opportunity with connection with your patients, but you do now. Can you kind of share a little light on that and how you bringing that gift has made a difference in, in the people that you're dealing with? Yeah. It's, a, it's interestingly, connection is 
um, my number one core value when I've done my my work to determine my values and went through you know some processes coaching and and um, it was clear that that was that was the thing that is most important in in my life is making connection with other human beings uh, and in the ER yeah you 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 have you you can make connections but they're quick you have to make them quickly mm-hmm. and that and learning how to do that is becomes a gift being able to make a connection with a patient who's afraid with a family member who's terrified and and have them trust you that that you're that that they're you're going to take care of them and do your best for them. They sometimes have to trust you pretty quickly to guide them to do things that are life and death. And there's not time to really contemplate a whole lot. But the, but the relationships were short. People moved on. And, and um, the early part of my career, that was, that, that was OK. I had my, my little kids and those connections and my friends. Over time, I really felt like one of the things that was missing in healthcare was a connection, was a trusted connection. And now that I, my, my work is revolving around going into people's homes for the most part, seeing them with their families in their home setting and helping to guide them through really challenging circumstances or opening them up to taking, bringing new things into their life which can really enhance their life. It's, it's so clear that one of the things that people want more than anything is, is a connection. And if they can have a connection with a doctor or a, or a medical team that is clearly there to help meet their needs, whatever they may be, it is so powerful in that it, it removes a sense of isolation and powerlessness. And, and so it, everybody wins. When we right. can make that connection and show that we care about people, they they get the benefit of that. Their families get the benefit of that. I get the benefit of that. I I'm fulfilling my mission, and if we can then through that connection help them have a better experience of life and prepare for an experience of a more peaceful, uh, dignified death, I, it's hard for me to think of anything more meaningful. But what would you like to do next to share even more of the the miracle of you? Well, um, I want to keep doing what we're doing because it's happening. There, we're, we're because of our model that we've created and the the results that we're getting with our patients and in the community. People are come are we're we're, we're drawing people to us and to my to this team who also feel a sense of purpose around supporting people through this really amazing time of life. So I want to continue building, developing the model that we have here in San Diego so that we can expand it. And that will happen also in kind of in conjunction with our foundation, which will also kind of take the lead on, on the education to the community, the education to the population, the education and training for the medical providers who need to learn a bit more about how to deal with end of life and, and approach these conversations and and really be a catalyst for changing the paradigm of how people experience the final phase of their life. Well, that's amazing. As you know, I, I believe in collective energy and just how powerful it is. So we're going to ask the imagination to to come together to help you create that vision and manifest it and bring it in because the, I think the model that you are building is going to be so powerful in, in helping other groups kind of find the same rhythm and the same opportunities that, that you're presenting. So thank you very much. We're oh, getting, yeah. We're getting I, a I little hope. close. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, just hearing you say that is is thrilling to me. Because it, it 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 takes the collective. It it does it can't happen from this little pocket of you know of San Diego. We have to be we have to find our you know our tribe. We have to we have to find our tribe and come together as a tribe. And and I know there are there are people all over the world who have similar you know philosophies and views and passions. And everyone's a, a lot of these people are doing their work and it's beautiful work and part of what's missing is the is the threads that connect them right, right. so people 
so bringing your your incredible tribe of people and community and others who you know who who believe in empowerment and love at any stage of life uh, we just want to help give them a, a, a trying to show a roadmap a little bit and then p put the pieces in place to bring the tribes together around this because this is the one thing that we all share right exactly exactly we, uh, there's two things in life that we all are guaranteed and that we share we were born can't really do much about how that went but we're all going to die and we 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 have an opportunity to really change to re to remove a lot of the fear that goes into around that and learn how to celebrate that idea and live more fully until the time that we have our rebirth right right and community is so important in, in every aspect of that from your aspect all the way through uh, up through the the patient's aspect or, or the dying individual's aspect, community is so important. We're, we're a little close on time here, so how about uh, a couple lightning round questions and then uh, I'll uh, give you an opportunity to give us a piece of guidance uh, as we say goodbye for the day. Sounds good. What's the biggest thing that is holding you back from experiencing the life that you want right now? There's nothing. Sorry, I can't. I, I I am experiencing the life that I want right now. That so. is excellent. <laughs> That's a quick one. It's it's very important because you know one of the reasons that I've asked you to come on the call with us and and to share who you are and what you're doing is because we can find that, and so many people don't believe that they can find the life that they want. So that's very positive and and very motivating for everyone. Share your favorite inspirational quote with us it's short well i mean it, it, i the one that i that i kind of live with um and i think about probably multiple times a day uh there's two and they're both very short um, one is to be committed but not attached and that's kind of how i try to live my life i have i i, I don't have to explain that committed but not attached mm -hmm. And the other one is something that my father said many times in the last uh, months of his life. He was diagnosed with, uh, my mom died of lung cancer in 2014. Eight months later, my dad, just out of the blue, was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And, uh, and he, had, he died four months later, but he had an amazing four months and had a, had a beautiful, peaceful death. And the, what he said to me multiple times as we were trying to figure out like why this happened, what, how do you make sense of it? And his response was, it is what it is. Mm. Mm -hmm. And a lot goes into that. It, you know, it almost seems glib or, you know, you know, poo poo it. But if, if you, if you can accept that it is what it is, it doesn't have to stay that way. There's so much you can do once you, once you accept that it is what it is, mm -hmm. uh, it helps to keep me grounded and present. Excellent, excellent. Could you share one piece of guidance with us uh, as we close up for the day? Hmm, one piece of guidance. Um, well, I think the, the thing that's coming up for me, uh, because this has been so m me magical and to allow me to, to do my work uh, in the deepest way that honors people is, is to... Um, to stay open and to stay um, naive in a sense and, and, and o approach everything with a sense of, of wonder and, and openness. And when I, you know, for me, how that, how that manifests is every time I go to see a new patient, a new family to deal with the situation that they're dealing with, I don't go in with an agenda I don't go in with you know, a, a preconception of what I'm going to be able to do for that person. I'm completely open to, to uh, with a sense of, of love and compassion, to understand who they are, what they're dealing with, and what they're, what's truly most important to them, and then kind of figure out where, what their gaps are, what their resources are, and, 
and just help help co-create with them a, a plan moving forward that honors them, empowers them, and helps them have the you know the most meaningful, uh, beautiful existence, however long that may be. So staying open to what's coming is powerful and and then it allows you to also just stay very present in that moment. Excellent guidance. I know many of the people that are on the podcast today and are going to listen to it in the future want to know how to learn more about and get in touch with Dr. Bob. Can you share that with us? Sure. I, I mean, anybody who's interested in communicating about their circumstances and maybe looking for some guidance can always reach out to me directly with, uh, by emailing me, which is drbob, D-R-B-O-B, at integratedmdcare.com. And that's my website, integratedmdcare.com, uh, where we have a lot of you know, resources and information about how we do it, how we, what we do, why we do it, how we do it. Um, I have a Facebook um, uh, page as well, Dr. Bob Uslander, um, and that's you know that's I was not I'm not hard to find. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much for being with us today, Bob. The information that you shared and the hope and understanding of how we can truly change our lives all the way up to the very last minute of it was so powerful. Thanks, Vince. It was really a pleasure. And. On behalf of Mary and myself, have a miracle day. Thank you. You too. You've completed this episode of The Miracle You, but we have plenty more to help you discover your own personal passion and purpose. Head over to themiracleyou.com for free resources to assist you on your journey, as well as register for our free webinar, Discover Your Miracle Life, Three Mind Awakening Steps Toward Your Unique Purpose, or apply for a one-on-one -on -one Your Life, Your Way breakthrough session and discover your next best step on your journey. All available exclusively on our website. That's themiracleyou.com. We look forward to sharing more experiences of passion, purpose, and life by design next time, right here on The Miracle You.